Howdy folks, Alex here. Um, we're trying something a little new this time. We're using the integrated webcam so that you can actually see me talking while I'm doing the screencast. And uh, I think you're supposed to be able to move the picture of me around in case it's covering part of the slide that you want to see. So uh, hopefully that works. Uh, if it doesn't work, I'll scratch this, but it's worth a shot. And you get to see me drink coffee. We're going to talk a little bit today about measures of central tendency. <coughs> in, uh, in descriptive statistics, there are two basic ways that we think about describing whatever it is. <coughs> Excuse me. One is to measure central tendency, to measure the tendency of our observations to sort of gather around a, a central point or central line or central something. And the other one is measures of variability or variation, which we'll get into in another series of screencasts. It's really interesting, I think, to have uh, measures of central tendency as a, a way to describe a particular sample because we're always trying to think about um, what does a particular group or observation or set of people or whatever look like. And measures of central tendency are some of the most common ways of, of doing that. We can use the mode, which is essentially the frequency of observed numbers. We can use the median, which is the middle, whatever the middle number is. And we can use the mean, which is the average. Whoops, average. These are all measures of a central tendency that you should be somewhat familiar with, either from uh, earlier schooling or just from daily life. Frequencies and averages, we actually do use quite a bit in day-to-day -day life. Medians, less often, although the concept is very simple. It's literally the middle number. So let's take a look a little more deeply into each of these. One, the mode is the most frequently occurring score on a variable. That's why it's the frequency idea. Right? It does not involve rank ordering of values or units of measurement. It is the only measure of central tendency useful for nominal variables. So if you have a nominal variable, you're going to want to be using the mode. Now there are some, <laughs> I have only here, but there are some exceptions to that. If you have a dichotomous, dichotomous nominal variable, like let's say a student's sex or gender, where you have male or female, and you might rank that 0 and 1. Um, now, technically, the only measure of central tendency for nominal variables is the mode, and so you can count how many males and how many females. But when you have dichotomous variables like this, especially zeros and ones, you can take the mean, and the mean will provide you with a proportion. For example, if we had a, uh, if we took all, uh, a survey of all of the students at Lehigh University, and we assigned every time we saw it was a male, we gave that person a zero. Every time we saw it was a female, we gave that person a one. And then we averaged all those zeros and ones. We would come up with something like 0.51, or maybe less. I can't, can't remember if there are slightly more or slightly less women at Lehigh in the total student population. Might be less. Anyway, in my little example here, if it was 0.51, that's a proportion. And if we multiplied that by 100, we would get a percent, which would be 51%. So this is a big uh, exception to this. But usually, the only measure of central tendency that's useful for nominal variables is the mode. And you'll see that that is true 99% of the time. It is a poor indicator of central tendency for continuous and interval ratio variables. But it is useful to know what the frequency is sometimes, especially if there is a relatively small uh, number of uh, cases in a sample, or you know it's just not like a bajillion different numbers, and each of them their frequency is one. That would not be very helpful. And if you want to think about mode, you can think about it in terms of unimodal or bimodal distributions. Distributions are when we actually look at the frequencies of a particular set of scores, and then we graph them. And so let's say um, we've got, uh, well, I'm going to show you a picture in a second. So a unimodal description is a dis distribution in which one score occurs considerably more often than other scores. In other words, it's a distribution with one mode, whereas a 
bimodal distribution has two values that occur more often than any other values. In other words, it's a distribution with two modes. So for example, in this, this graph, we have a unimodal distribution. Let's say that these are answers to a multiple choice question. Right? And we can see basically the frequency, a count, of how many times a, a small class answered A, B, C, D, or E on that multiple choice question. The answer A was given one time, the answer B was given two times, the answer C three times, D two times, and E one time. Right? It's just counting, it's frequency. But the mode is C because it has the most frequently occurring um, response. Right? It's unimodal, there's only one most frequently occurring. However, if we look at bimodal, same deal. Let's say that these are answers on a multiple choice uh, test question, and we're simply counting how many times students answer with each of those uh, choices. We can see that B and D are both answered four times. People, students in this class chose answers B and D the same number. And so we have a bimodal distribution. We usually try to draw a curve over these things. If I were to draw a curve over this, it would just look like this. Right? So bimodal distribution because it has two modes. The median, marching right along, is simply the value that divides an ordered set of scores in half. So an ordered set of scores, you can already tell what kind of level of measurement we're going to be using here. Right? And it divides it in half. It requires that the scores be rank ordered. You have to put them in order first. It is really only for ordinal or interval ratio. You wouldn't want to use this with nominal because there is no value to the ones and zeros and twos or whatever we might assign to uh, the categories or the values for variables that are nominal. And one of the benefits of the median is that extremely high or extremely low scores don't affect the median. So remember we're trying to measure central tendency but there are sometimes scores that are going to be extremely outside of the, the typical range. We call these outliers. And those outliers have a tendency to drag the, the measure of central tendency, especially the mean, one way or the other, either up or down or whatever. Well, the median doesn't respond to that. And we'll give you an example of how that works a little bit later. If you want to find the median, you, you simply could put the numbers in order and then just look at the middle one. Ta -da, there it is. There's one, two, three, four, five, and then you, if you count it from the bottom, one, two, three, four, five. So we have five. Uh, either way, you come in at it. Or you could put the scores in, lower, in order from lowest to highest. Find the middle score, like I just did. You could also do this little trick. Um, N plus one divided by two gives you the rank or the position of the median. So in my example here, it'd be nine plus one, which is 10, divided by two, equals 5. Lo and behold, there it is. Uh, if you have, uh, and here's another example, an odd number of scores, here are your original scores, rank order the scores, and there's your median. All right, if you have an even number of scores, it becomes a little fuzzier, um, but it's the same sort of approach. You put the scores in order from lowest to highest and find the two middle scores. And then if you want to find the exact median, even if they're whole numbers in the, in the set of uh, variables, um, you can average the two middle scores by adding them and then dividing by two. So for example, if you have an even number of scores, you want to rank order, which we've done over on this side, and then you find the two middle scores, average them, and voila. You could also do the trick from before, n plus one divided by two, so that'd be 10 plus 1, which is 11, divided by 2. 11 divided by 2 is 5 and a half. Okay. Next, the mean. This is the most frequently used measure of central tendency. Um, we, we use this all the time. I'm sure you, you might have even used it today or this week. Uh, I know I did. Anyway, it's the arithmetical average of all scores. So we usually use the word average when we're sort of talking about this in daily life, although in statistics we tend to use the word mean. 
and it is the sum of the scores divided by the number of scores. Very simple approach. Add all the scores, divide by the number of scores. So what we have here is a symbol for mean. Um, by the way, this X with a bar over it is also often used to denote mean. But we have the mean equals, and this sigma means sum. This XI is indicates each of the individual scores in our set of scores. Right? So the sum of all the scores divided by the number of scores. All right. We tend to use it only for interval ratio variables with the exception of dichotomous nominal variables like I showed you earlier, especially if they are coded 0 and 1. But that is, that is unique. Um, and so it's best to remember, use the mean for interval ratio variables. The mean will use all the scores in its calculation so it takes advantage of all the available data. Now that's a good thing for the most part unless you have some outliers. So extreme scores, including outliers, affect the mean but not the median or the mode. So if you look at these two examples here, I've given you uh, two sets of data in these original scores columns that are exactly the same except for student C in example 1 the score is 10. For student C in example 2 the score is 1000. I just wanted to show you this is the outlier case right? I wanted to show you what happens to the mode and the median and the mean when you have one extreme outlier like this. And so you'll notice when we rank order the scores we have 1 through 10. The mode is 8 uh, because there are two 8's here. Right? The median, the middle score, is 6 because if we uh, look at these 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, the middle score would be in here. Right? So we are looking for what's the score in the middle? If we were being very exact, we'd say it's 5 and 7. But because we're averaging those two middle scores when we have an even number, we're coming up with a median of 6. And the mean, we add all these scores together, and divide by the number of original scores, is 5.7. Okay? Do the same thing over here, except instead of 10, you have 1,000. Lo and behold, the mode is 8. The median is 6. The mean, however, gets yanked way over to the, the larger side by this 1,000. So you can see that extreme scores affect the mean, but not the median or the mode, which is an advantage for you when you're dealing with uh, especially large sets of data where it's difficult to tell um, what the measure of central tendency or where the central tendency naturally lies and you might have some outliers. You can look at the mean, median, and mode and see, oh my gosh, maybe there's something that's yanking it way over. Now here's that special case I was telling you about. The mean for a dichotomous variable coded 0 or 1 equals the proportion of cases coded as 1. Apparently I'm running over that. Sorry, I thought there were more slides. Uh, we did this before. This is the same example. If I have female equals 1 and male equals 0 and I've got a set of students and I've coded them 1 for female, 0 for male, and I take the average or the mean of all that, I come up with 0.6. That tells me that 60% of my student group is female. Next we're going to talk about the sum of deviations from the mean. And I'm actually going to pause here and go to the next screencast because this is when we, we sort of bleed over a little bit into talking about how measures of central tendency and measures of variability are associated. So we'll do this in the next screencast.